I want to be able to hear God and not because I'm preoccupied. Challenge me! You gotta be willing to do what God tells you. What's really going on? What's really going on when officers are being killed? When black men are being killed? When rioters and picketers and protesters are being killed? When there's so much r racial issues going on and racial tension and hatred and violence and anger, what's going on from Dallas to Milwaukee to Ferguson to Tulsa to Baton Rouge to Charlotte and everywhere else, I have to ask the question, what's really going on? Today, I'm not going to have all the answers. If I can just get you to think a little bit, then I've accomplished my job. If I could get you to just simply have a little bit of dialogue and conversations with the people that you influenced, then I'll think today is a success. What's going on when things are not being resolved or not changing or fast enough or things just seemingly are not getting better? When there's so much uncertainty and instability and nervousness and fear and sorrow and pain and anguish and confusion and anxiety and funerals and deaths, what's really going on? Again, I don't have all the answers. I stand at risk of of offending. I stand at risk of misquoting. I have a, a stand at risk of, of misinterpreting. I am not a politician. I am not a social activist. I am not a community leader. I am not a lawyer. I am not an educator. I am not a historian. I am not a legislator, nor am I a councilman. I am a Christian. I am a pastor. And I am a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ who cares and is concerned and wants to help. I pastor a multicultural church that is predominantly black or African American. I am a Mexican. I was born a Mexican. But in 1979, I found my way to a fledgling church that was starting in their home. Did not know that the pastors were black. I would submit to that church for the next 15 years of my life. My spiritual mother, my spiritual father, that developed me, shaped me, and allowed me to grow in the things of God were African American black individuals. They hired me after I went to Bible school as their children and youth pastor. And so for nine years, I had the privilege of being a pastor to black children. That church was 99% black. I had the privilege, who some are still here today but now are married and have children. I, pa I was a youth pastor to those teenagers. I today, my closest friends are not just Latin. My closest friends are black and white and Asian. My church board, the one that I submit to and I'm accountable to, that garnishes and watches over my marriage and my integrity and the holiness of what I live, and the one that sets my salary is made up of African Americans and whites and Latins. It's a multicultural church. Our directors are multicultural. Our staff is multicultural. Those that come into this pulpit, I always make sure that there is an equal voice represented within this church. 
I want you to recognize today, my family is multicultural. I married a white woman. My three sons married women of other races. My oldest son married a Persian woman, and I have a Persian grandson. My second son married a Korean woman. I have Korean grandbabies. My third son married an African-American woman. Though not yet in the future, I will have African-American grandchildren. And as I put this message together, I ask the question, should this happen to me? And it, it, it's possible. It's very probable that it will. That possibly my 12-year-old grandson will come before me and he'll say, Grandpa, some kids called me some names at school. They made fun of me. Papa, I don't know what's going on in the world, in the television. I'm scared. My friends want to fight, Papa. What do I do? And so with that in mind, I put myself there, knowing it could probably happen, saying, what would I say? What's really going on to my 12-year-old grandson? And so for that, I speak to you today. Let's pray. Father, help me. Open our hearts. May we not have predetermined understanding or mindsets, but let us hear out everything, God, and weigh the matters and see where truth lies. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says in Matthew 24 and verse number 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, which means then it's possible in these last days to be deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, or this is the way of Christianity, or this is what Christians do. And it says, and will deceive, misled, misguided people will fall into error. And he says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. See that you are not anxious, nervous, for all these things will possibly come to pass. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations will rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. And there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. Watch this. And all of this is the beginning of sorrows and sadness. I want you to recognize what you just read. Notice what it said. And nations will rise against nations. In the Greek, this word is ethos where we get the word ethnicity. He says, in these last days, ethnic races will rise up against ethnic races. In these last days, there will be racial issues going on. But he said, I don't want you to be deceived. Who's he talking to? This is not a politician. This is not a news reporter. This is not the internet. This is Jesus talking to us, which to me play, pays a heavy matter that I need to pay attention. He said there's going to be trouble. There's going to be sorrow. I don't know necessarily that he's talking that there's going to be sorrow in our lives. He's saying there's going to be sorrow in the world, and so I want you to be ready, prepared, armed to deal with your sorrowful neighbor, your sorrowful coworker, and your sorrowful friend that doesn't know how to navigate through the times and the seasons that we're living in. And he's saying, it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. So I'd say to my, my grandson, what's really going on? We're living in the last days, son. And this is one of the last day signs. And there will be many other signs that you and I will see. 
Hey, I want to talk to a little bit of the real audience, all you faithful followers and watchers. If you got a tremendous story of how this program has touched your life, changed your life, or benefited your life, we'd love to highlight it some way by sharing your story, maybe with someone that hasn't heard the change that's taken place through this program. Your story will inspire others' stories that will cause transformation to take place. Help me to build the kingdom of God. Share your story with us. We'd love to hear from you. I want to share with you some quotes today about somebody that was not silent. He says, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out, our hate, out hate, only love can do that. When evil men plot, good men must plan. When evil men burn and bomb, good men must build and bind. When evil men shout ugly words of hatred, good men must commit themselves to the glories of love. We must learn to live together as brothers or we will perish together as fools. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate. People fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other. I have decided to stick with love, hate, is too great of a burden to bear. <laughs> Acts 17, 28 says, For he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of this earth, one blood, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. There is neither Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free, male nor free, female, for you are all one in Christ. Here's what I would say. We are more alike than different, but yet we are different. We are more alike than different, but yet we are different. We are different because we interpret things different. Our perspective is different. Our experiences are different. Our wounds and our pains are different. How we deal with things is different. How we've been treated is different. Our battles and our oppositions are different. We must put ourselves in other people's shoes. If restoration and reconciliation is ever going to take place. You have to talk to people that think differently than you if you're going to grow. If all you do is hang out with people that look like you and think like you, you are never going to grow. That there might be another perspective. When a few weeks ago, I watched Colin Kaepernick take a knee on the sidelines. Immediately the, the patriotic, patriotic person in me was offended. The people that loves the military and everything that the flag, flag represents was offended. I asked Dana Hall, a former 49er, what he thought, why? Because I wanted his perspective. I asked young 30-year-old black men what they thought to get their perspective. And I thought to myself, is he breaking a law? No. Would I do it that way? Probably not. But I'm not a 30-year-old black man neither. And I don't know what it is, and I will never know. And I can play around all day long and say I'm a black -sican. <laughs> But the outside of me will always be Latin. And until I put myself and make myself uncomfortable in the shoes of someone else, I will never know. 
I will never know what it is to be a child that's black or a teenager boy that's black or go and look for a job or go and want a, uh, an education or drive down the street in a car or all the things. I don't know. I don't understand it. But here's my statement. I get it, but I don't got it. And I probably will never because I'm not black. I'm not. And so when people say, why don't you just get over it? You're asking me to get over 200 years of slavery. I can't get over it. And when something rises up again, it strikes the chords of all the emotions of the past that maybe something that happened to me when I was five years old or the stories that my grandfather told me of, of, of fountains that were black and white and restrooms and not going into a restaurant. So tell me to get over it. I'd love to, but it's tough. I don't know what that is. When I go fly international, me and Cindy joke, because when we fly in international, we go through various lines with TSA. They let her pass, and I am literally right behind her as her husband, and they give me the, they go like this. Not in the United States. They'll never do that because they know what I am. But international, I have a face that they're not sure what I am. They've not been around Mexicans a lot. They don't know what I am. So they go like this, and I say, here we go again. <laughs> the brother can't get a break. I tell Cindy, the brother band can't get a break. <laughs> you ask her, God is my witness. I'm not making this up. She says, let's see if you get through the line. And then they, come on. Come. <laughs> can I see your passport? Can I, can I see your ticket? Can I look through your bad thing? I'm thinking to myself, I just went through the machine. Somebody already looked through it. And, see, I could let that rise up. But see, that's a moment. I don't have a lifetime of that. I don't have that wherever I go. So I have to prepare myself. Diego, you're doing international travel, and you might have that uncomfortable feeling take place to you. I love to go down to San Diego. And sometimes when I drive back from San Diego, I see these green cars on the side of the freeway or the highway. They are immigration. They're border patrol. And all of a sudden, I see them move off of the road next to me because I have a nice, brand new, shiny truck, and I'm a Mexican, and I got a white woman next to me. And so they'll come on. I'm not making this up. They'll come alongside of me, they'll look at me, they'll look at her, they'll draw back, they'll stay there for about two minutes as they run my license plate, and then they go away. That's a minute, a second of my life. I don't know what it is, but I want to say this again, I get it, but I don't got it. Hey guys, in our endeavor to become much more personal and be much more relational and to get to know you a little bit better, if you have a question that you'd like to ask me, I'm not going to claim to be a Bible scholar, a great theologian, or maybe even to know uh, all the answers, but I'll try to my best of my ability uh, to respond to you with any question that you might have that we might be able to help you to get close to Christ, know Him or further your faith in Him. Love to hear from you. See, where are we alike? It's obviously we all cry, we all care, we all hurt, we all love, we all laugh, we want to marry right, we want happy marriage, we want children, happiness, health. But I want you to recognize, when you hear statements that black lives matter, understanding what they're not saying. They're not saying black lives matter more than you. They're just saying black lives matter too. And all they're saying is this, all we want is the same rights. And whether it is blacks or whether it is other people or whether it's other situations, we just want the same equal rights as everyone else. That's all we're saying. 
If you don't have to jump through hoops, then why make us jump through hoops? If you're found innocent before you're proven guilty, then give us that chance. That's all they're asking for. But where are we alike? We're alike because bad things happen to good people. Because we live in a fallen world and there's a devil in this world. And people do evil and allow him to influence. So the innocent and the undeserving and the blameless have bad things happen to them. They get fired. They experience death and losses, betrayal, infidelity. Things are stolen and lied. Even though, how can this happen? I'm a good person. Because you live in a bad world and there's a bad devil. Life isn't always going to make sense. And we're not always going to have the answers and the explanation. Sometimes the unexpected happens. But in all these scenarios, there is a reality and there is an experience that Jesus knows and Jesus cares and Jesus understands. In Luke 13, Jesus said... Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? See, there was a tragedy, an accident that had happened during Jesus' lifetime. And some form of devastation, a building, people died and they went to Jesus and said, Jesus, did that happen because they're sinners and bad people? He said, no. Why are you so quick to judge people? So I want you to recognize I don't understand. Others may not understand. But Jesus was hated. He was abandoned. He was despised. He was wounded. He was rejected. He was abused. He was misused. He was betrayed. He was lied upon. And he was mocked. He was falsely accused, falsely charged, falsely arrested, unjustly convicted, went through a bogus trial, had no attorney, false charges, guilty before he was innocent, wrongly sentenced to die for a crime he did not do, and then he was executed. Jesus understands and he can be touched with the feelings of your infirmity. I can't change the world, but I can change me. And that's where you go from this. I can't be responsible for people's actions or reactions, but I can be responsible for how I act. I can't make people do right, but I can make me do right. I'm not responsible for others, but I am responsible for myself. And so I've got to see what in me may need to be healed and delivered. When I choose to want to not identify but separate. What is that within me? And that can happen race in race issues. It's not always the opposite race that does that. It's internally that does that. So sometimes some name callings of us needs to stop. How we make fun of each other. The movie and the music that we listen to. It's wonderful that we get angry over here, but why don't we get angry over here? Because before I'm black, Latin, Asian, or white, before I'm a public Republican or a Democrat, before I'm a veteran, before I'm a plumber or a lawyer, I am a Christ follower. And that warrants and takes precedent over every action, reaction, thought, word, attitude, motive. See, these times test whether you are a Christian or not. If you'd like to connect with us at Real with Diego Mesa, please visit our website. Here you'll be able to watch current and past episodes, learn more about Abundant Living Family Church, and visit our virtual store. And don't forget to like us on Facebook. I am so proud if you are members or attenders or visitors of Abundant Living Family Church. This is a multicultural church. And if you are going to 
join a multicultural church, it's not always going to be the way you like it. But it challenges you to grow. See, people just want to go to all white churches and all black churches and all Asian churches. I have no problem with that if that's what your community represents. But if you can't go to the mall or the restaurant, then you need to be forced because that's what heaven is. You're not going to always get the music you like. You're not always going to get the preaching style you like. You're not always going to get the programs you like. But that's okay. Because it's about the vision. It's about souls. It's about where God called me. And churches like this, the devil hates. Martin Luther King said the most segregated hour during the week is Sunday mornings. Because people want to be comfortable. This is forces our love. It forces our community. It forces us to be family. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for navigating through the changes that I can't just appeal to one race of people. Because everybody is important in the kingdom of God. Hey, again, I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for watching. And hopefully now um, you've been ministered to. Hopefully it creates some conversation that you could have with other people. I just want to challenge you today that you ask God if there's anything in you that resembles any form of hatred or racism or profiling or prejudgment or stereotyping based upon how I was raised based upon an experience that I had. You know what? We need to ask God to take these things out of us. Just go down deep to the root of it and help us really to love people and help us to see a different viewpoint of how people were raised and help us to be more compassionate, as the message says, to more reconcile than to divide and separate. So I just want us to pray that God would take those things out of us that can cause these uh, stereotypes to take place in our lives or these preconceived ideas. So, Father, I just thank you in the name of Jesus that you would heal our hearts, God. If there's anything in us that shows uh, hatred or racism or prejudgment toward any individual, God, based upon something that's happened to us, we just pray that you would deliver us from anything of the past so that we can walk into the future and really embrace people with love, Father. Take out those things in us, O oh God, that have been generating through generations of our families, O oh God, that has caused us to be closed-minded, to, to, to name-call God, uh, to not welcome people or celebrate people. Help us to love people the way you love people. You love the Jew. You love the Samaritan, God. You love the Gentile. You love the man, you love the woman, God. You love the slave, God. You loved all types of people when you walked the face of this earth. For you died for all mankind. Help us to love like you, in Jesus' name. You gotta be willing to do what God tells you.